What's up, ladies and gentlemen, who are not me, because I am not Boogie Tonight at 8. Ah, uh, what is going on, guys? Ah, <clears throat> uh, welcome to the thing that I do every Sunday. Ah, uh, get rid of that. There we go. Sorry. I mean, I guess we do actually have a voot on, so I'm going to leave that up. We do have a voot going on right now. We do have a voot. He's informing you guys to voot. He might also be informing me to voot technically, based on the way this is lining up. <sighs> ah. Hell of a morning. I haven't even had time to shave lately. Now, what's funny is I probably won't have time to shave in the near future, too. I've been working... I've already begun work on my next big rumination. Which is, of course, the uh, Lord of the Rings uh, rumination. This right here... <clears throat> this first... I don't know if you can tell here. Let me pull up the camera. I don't know if you can really tell how much... There we go. You can kind of see my notes there. This right here is about how many notes I have, for example... This is a, a pretty good example of an average Battle and Five or Voyager. You know, this is about how many notes I have for a full episode, so about 30-ish minutes. Um, I haven't started the movies yet. This is all behind-the-scenes stuff. This is all making of. Yeah, it's, it's a big project. Um, if I'm being honest, I wish I wasn't doing it. I know that sounds weird, but what I wish I was doing... I wish I had the time and money to really invest into this the way I want to, to make this like a, a, a grand rumination. Because I think that would be awesome. But I don't have the time and money to do that, so you're just going to get a normal rumination, and I hope that my normal stuff is good enough for you. <sighs> um, I'm going to cover some really quick stuff before we get to the, the big stuff. And... Uh, why would I not do the extended editions? What kind of maniac would not do the extended editions? There is no other edition other than the extended editions. I'm just putting that out there. I want to talk about uh, the fact that Blizzard recently implemented a policy where the WoW tokens that you can procure with real uh, with gold in game are now usable for things like Hearthstone cards and Overwatch packs, and they are. Uh, doing their thing with that. That's an interesting economic model. The thing is funny because people are like, oh my god, clearly this just means Blizzard's going to be making less money. And yet the really weird thing when you think about it <coughs> is the fact that that's the exact opposite. This is actually encouraging people to spend real money on the game more and actually buying gold with this stuff. It's happening. It's happening rather frequently. It's working for the exact same reason that it's always worked. Because people have been selling gold for the last 10 years. The only difference now is the fact that Blizzard's actually selling you the gold rather than some Chinese guy or some Korean guy who's trying to steal your account, too. So, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm fighting off something. Everyone in my immediate family has been sick lately, including the little one. Uh, so, yeah. Yes, as Venters points out, the, the economy has inflated sharply as a result of this change, which is making people very upset, understandably, having to dump 100,000 gold or 150,000 gold. I forget what it is on my server. Uh, in order to get a token is a lot worse than it used to be. <sighs> which, uh, on my server, for example, is about 30-something thousand gold. We'll see, uh, we'll see exactly how that ends up working out. Now, um, t I just wanted to point that out really quick. Uh, what else did I have in the in the really quick news thing? Uh, anyone want to make fun of Konami really quick? <laughs> I'm serious. You want to make fun of Konami? Wow, you can actually kind of see my pronounced canines there, can't you? I was talking about this just yesterday when we were discussing. Should we see that? They're quite sharp. They're quite horrible. Who wants to make one of Konami? So, Konami is uh, coming out with a new Bomberman game. Um, this image really says everything that needs to be said about it, to be completely blunt. Really, this, sa this says everything you need to know about the new Bomberman game. 
I'm just gonna leave it up there for a minute so you can soak in all the details. I mean, it's a fairly standard, bog standard Bomberman PvP game. Uh, with, except that's Bomberman on the left, one of the Bombermans. Uh, obviously, it's actually Bomber Girl. And yes, their clothes do appear to have some kind of destructible nature and lots of, lots of things, and it's, it's ridiculous. I, I got nothing else to say about that, to be blunt. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Moving on. Uh, other quick things. At the end of today's lore week, I want to talk about writing and setting building. So you guys are going to endure that or die. Also, we've got a voot going on right now as to whether or not we'll be doing Blizzard Sunday or playing The Wolf Among Us. Starting The Wolf Among Us. I don't actually know if we'll be able to finish The Wolf Among Us today. And if we get to Monday... If it, I will not be streaming on Monday. I have way too much work to do. Uh, and this is a week off for me, which means I have to commit 100% of my time to recording for the YouTube side of things. It's the only reason I can even keep up at all right now with the show. is because I get one week off a month where I can just completely focus on recording. And that's all I do. So, uh, no streaming is going to happen this week. Uh, so, just a heads up on that. If we start Wolf Among Us, we might not finish it today. We'd have to finish it next Saturday. Just keep that in mind. Also, uh, next week we are definitely doing some Blizzard Sunday stuff because that's when they're going to have the 15 thing, uh, the 15 Blizzard uh, Heroes of the Storm matches in order to get the awesome mounts in both WoW and Heroes of the Storm. So that's happening regardless. So, uh, let's see. What else did I have in my little brief notes things? What else we got here? I swear I had something else minor to talk about, but I didn't write it down because I'm an idiot. I'm kind of tired, can you tell? Uh, right now, the voot is wonderfully tied. Blizzard Sunday is literally leading by one. <laughs> uh, I'm okay with either. I am ambivalent. So, uh, and I, I need to get a hold of Third. He's the only person I know who actually has an Android who has the app, so one I'll, I'll discuss it with him, because I don't have an Android and I don't have the app. Uh, if I end up, of course, going through Wolf Among Us, we will probably end up doing some more Telltale stuff in the future. Uh, Back to the Future was vooted in, so we are going to be doing Back to the Future, of course. And we might actually, uh, we might end up doing uh, the Michonne or whatever it is, Tales. I'm still not sure why. Apparently it's, like, irrelevant to Season 2 and Season 3 and everything else about Telltale. It's con directly connected to the comics and therefore I have no invested interest in it. I'll let you guys vote if we ever do that because I'd have to buy it. I of course have not bought Season 3 yet because it's not out yet, as, as in it's not finished yet, and therefore Season 3 will absolutely not be happening until all of Season 3 is out. That's, that's, a, that's a hard line, that's not changing. And uh, we've also gonna be, uh, in, in the future, we're gonna be going through the rest of Final Fantasy Type-0, as well as finishing off Just Cause 3, which is going to be a fairly short stream, if I'm honest, but it is something I want to do. We have given up on sorcery. No one ever wants that, so we're just going to abandon that completely, and I'll finally toss those up. I've been waiting to toss those up on YouTube, but we're going to go ahead and abandon sorcery. I've also got a few other things planned. We're going to finish off Child of Light as well. That's something we're going to be streaming, just going through the rest of Child of Light, a, a casual stream, basically a chill run. And... Uh, at some point, probably after all of everything I just said, we're going to do a little bit of a Paradox Blast, where we're going to be hitting Crusader Kings 2 with some additional DLCs this time, and a little bit of a better idea of what I'm doing. I'm probably playing as Ireland. And then we'll be doing Europa Universalist 4, the watch lore runner screw up and fail at a thing. Uh, thing, so... By the way, this is the poll. I'm going to link the actual poll. Anybody linking anything else is incorrect, just to make that 100% clear. <laughs> so the poll I just linked is the one that we are actually keeping track of. So watch the poll I'm linking. So uh, let's go ahead and we're going to be doing something weird with our timestamps today. How's the audio volume? I'll just make clear. Overwatch has finally decided... I have no idea of Eldrix. Probably no time soon, to be completely honest. Um, Witcher 3 is probably going to be started sometime soon. I'm guessing next Monday, based on the way things are going right now, but we'll see. <sighs> Overwatch has finally decided to start... Oh, there, that was something else I was going to talk about. 
do allowing fully customized playstyles with regards to setting up the custom matches. So that's neat. Uh, it's nice that they're allowing us the kind of variety they are. They, the uh, types of things they're allowing include changing the usages of hero abilities, uh, customization on cooldown times, payload speed, capture speed, whether or not you allow individual heroes, uh, the time it takes to pick up a flag, the the type of flag, uh, the, the, the CTF... I don't understand. Oh, so whether or not you have to have the flag in order to capture the flag, missile speed, unit speed, all sorts of stuff they're adding and have added. It's actually already on the PTR as of now. And there's a couple of people who have been coming up with their own game modes as a result of this new... Oh, God damn it. As a result of this new system. And all of this, like, for example allows for you to do, there's the one that actually caught my eye was this predator mode thing which allows you to I'm not even going to be able to find, you know what, I don't even care whatever, uh, so for example anyone ever played Goldeneye back on the N64 where you'd run around and everyone has one HP so if you see someone else at all it's dead, you know and uh, you know, that's I, I like it. Um, I'm, it is stuff that should have been added before now, and it still doesn't actually really sell me on the game, per se. Keeping in mind, I own Overwatch. But what I mean by that is that's not what I wanted. I've been talking for some time now how I think Overwatch has been critically underselling itself, and it doesn't have the variety of game modes it needs to have. This feels like a pseudo-arcade mode because players can come up with their own game modes and that's nice and that's good but that's still not what I wanted what I want is them to come up with their own game modes I want them to add new mechanics and new gameplay and new new functionality to the game rather than just allow you to tweak things uh, as all willy-nilly I apparently did miss your question Valvatrix unless I missed it uh, the predator mode I mentioned basically ha it's a 3v1 uh, three people who are playing as soldiers who, uh, and one person who's playing a Sombra. Sombra is buffed, the three soldiers are nerfed, and nobody can heal on either team. And so, and Sombra, of course, can, can stealth more quickly and more often than they can, so... You know, and, and stuff like that is the kind of stuff you can do with custom game modes. There's also one called Zombie Mode, which I think is actually a bit misnamed, where you've got one line of... Oh, I did actually answer that question, Valvadrix. The answer is I have no freaking clue, but at the moment I don't even have it on my radar, to be blunt. <sighs> um, the Zombie Mode is where you've got a bunch of Reinhardts who are super buffed to hell, except in their speed. They are super slow, and I mean just... You know, walking speed, and the other persons are n normal people who have to try and go after the slowly and crunching wall of Reinhardt's. And yeah, as Zoan points out, this is stuff that's been in Team Fortress 2 for a while, and uh, I, I mean, this is good. This is a good thing that they're adding. I just don't give them a lot of praise for it. This is kind of a cheap thing to do and a relatively easy thing to do. It's basically allowing the players to tweak things that already exist rather than adding new things onto the existing structure. So uh, it would be nice if they did more. Also, Valvadrix, make sure to ask Gary uh, about the FF14 thing because he will probably be playing it before I am, to be 100% fun. Uh, anyways, there's, there's a bunch of cool stuff you can do with it, but shrug. I really don't have anything neat to say about it. What I do want to say... Rooster Race. That's a good question, Eru. If you find out the answer to that, let me know. Uh, <laughs> so... That's why I didn't answer you earlier. I didn't have an answer. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I don't... This is yeah. This is basically uh, modding. Is really I mean this isn't literally modding, but in terms of gameplay design, that is what they're doing. They're basically releasing the mod tools, kind of like Bethesda does with Elder Scrolls and with the Fallout series. Is they're like here, make content, make your own tweaks, and they've just kind of opened that up. I've said this before, and I've said they get a lot. Bethesda gets a lot of crap for this. Some other companies get a lot of crap for this. I still firmly stand in support of the idea of releasing these kind of tools to the players. I am firmly in favor of this idea. It's just they don't get that. They don't get different credit. They just get credit for releasing it. They get credit for allowing the players to tweak stuff. That's cool. I'm with that. Uh, they. Uh, I, I would still like to see them do more.
Now, uh, that's why I said it's not literally modding. It's just, it's it's like, it's in, in, in the category, it would be modding, is what this is. Uh, I also think, personally, that they should allow full-on arcade mode stuff. Uh, for those of you who don't know what, I mean, know what I mean by that, that's taking a StarCraft II term. In other words, there should be UMS stuff. They should allow us to make our own maps and to make our own uh, game modes. I think that would be cool as well. I understand that that would be incredibly difficult and expensive, and to be blunt, I would much rather they toss that out the window in favor of a single-player campaign, or, uh, I don't know, how about a co-op campaign would actually fit much better if you think about it. So a full co-op campaign mode, or just new game modes in general. There's so much they could do with Overwatch that they aren't. It's really irritating, Blizzard. I love you so much, but what the hell are you doing with here with, with Overwatch and with Hearthstone? You're not doing jack with either of them. They're not. They're, I'm sorry, they're not. Heroes of the Storm is the one game... Actually, that's not true. Heroes of the Storm and WoW and StarCraft II are the games that they're really pushing and really adding new stuff to it, and I'm really enjoying. It's it's the, uh, the other two that I'm just like... But it's also possible that what's happening here is that both Overwatch and Hearthstone are working as is, and they are worried about putting time and money into something that might not uh, be worth it on a profitability scale. They might just be try saying, you know what, people like death matches in Overwatch, people like PvP battles in Hearthstone, keep it, you know? And and as much as I absolutely hate that, that mentality, uh, it is a valid one from a purely economic perspective. They're making a Castlevania show. Netflix is producing a Castlevania TV show. I have actually an interview here. Uh, it's going to be coming out sometime this year. Uh, who's this? What's this gentleman's name? Uh, I have no idea how to pronounce this guy's name. Adi Shankar, or something like that. Uh, he is actually a Castlevania fan. And he's a fan of video games in general, and he's one of the main people pushing the new, the new show. Unfortunately, there's almost no real details about the show right now. They've been very mum on the details. I'm not really sure anything I really need to know about it. You know, whether or not it's going to be live action or animated, for example, is something that I wasn't able to find out. Yeah, probably to quite. I mean, I, I, I don't really know actually what to say about this. Uh, Lord knows this is actually kind of logical because of the gay, uh, Bloodstained, I think is the name of the game. I keep forgetting. I'm, I'm backing and I keep forgetting the name of it, which is coming out soon and has been generating more and more interest with regards to Castlevania in general and therefore is the kind of thing that would make people think, oh, we need to jump on that as quickly as possible. There's, I'm not sure what to make of this, <laughs> but I want to share a quote here, if I can find the exact quote I'm looking for. Ah, here it is. Uh, <clears throat> so, the guy who's being interviewed, the pilot of the original series, you can skip the cage if that's what you mean, the one, but you should see where no man has gone before. It was bloodstained, I was right. So... I saw that, Maleus. I, I thought about mentioning it, but it's there's not really any news in it. It's just, hey, we're, we're doing what we've always known we're doing. Um, so the guy says, you know, okay, you're 40... Uh, so the guy who is being interviewed, uh, I'll do him in a normal voice, and I'll do the interviewee with, like, a weird accent. So he says, how old are you? And the guy says, I am 44. Okay, so there must have been a period of your life when you were playing video games, and people are like, what the hell are you doing? Ugh, yes, absolutely, yeah. That is screwed up, dude. Video games are like... This is almost a direct quote. I'm, I'm censoring his, his cussing. That's it. Video games are like the dopest art form that exists today. It blows my mind that, like, photographers... I don't want to call anybody out... Are treated as more an artist than a video game designer. And it blows my freaking mind. That's ridiculous. What's cool about video games is, like... Are you into first-person shooters? Okay, if you've never played Overwatch and you've never played Call of Duty, like, you've played Halo. You can pick up the controller and you know exactly what's going on. You understand the language, because what's happening is a language that's been created, and we've all seen it evolve over the last few decades. If you're a gamer, you've seen the language of gaming evolve. And so, 
Uh, that, that, and then he keeps going on for a while, but he, he goes into how his opinion is that video games are an art form that is massively uh, un, unrepresented, underappreciated, and, and pushed down as a medium and being looked down upon, which is certainly uh, rather valid, I would say. There's a reason we have that stigma of video game movies are bad. You know, we've had that stigma for most of the existence of that concept being a thing. And the exceptions to video game movies being bad is, of course, always variable, but can usually be counted on one hand, sometimes two hands. Um, so I agree with the gentleman. He's absolutely right. Uh, video games are still in the same state that movies were, or excuse me, that television was, which is in the same state that movies was in, which is in the same state that books were in, which is in the same state that theater was in. I've talked about this before. I'll talk about it again. This is something that goes back centuries in human history. There's always some medium that's usually a more recent medium or a medium that's only recently started really being expanded that all the, the artsy hauteur people just kind of look down on as if it's childish, as if it's for kids, as if it's inferior, as if it doesn't have literary merit, as if it doesn't have artistic merit, etc., etc. And that's all bullcrap, and it always has been, for the same reason it was with books and movies and television and theater. No, I have not, Darkstar. Uh, and I don't plan to. <laughs> and I don't want to get on my own horse on this, my, my own... Uh, soapbox in this, but what I do want to say is that I am hopeful that at least that this show will be good. It brings to mind a question. Have we ever had a really good video game show? Donkey Kong Country Show? Anyone remember that one? How about uh, how about the uh, the Mortal Kombat show or the other Mortal Kombat show? How about the Mario World show? Anyone remember that one? How about the old Mario Brothers show? Swing your arms from side to side. We we had did have a couple of Sonic shows. Two that I'm aware of. We actually talked about this previously, Malaeus, and I'm not sure that Pokemon counts. It's debatable, because Pokemon the show, ironically, is very divergent from Pokemon the game. Digimon, I don't, I'm not versed in, to actually con count on. I never liked Digimon, so I can't actually talk about that. Yeah, there was, Beast Wars was good. Beast Wars was good. Uh, Beast Wars was also not a video game show, and therefore does not count. The FF5 anime, no comment. <laughs> um, I only know of two, Micromana, but I believe you. I know about... There was one that was really cringeworthy, which I hated. And and then the, wasn't there one based on the Archie comics? By the way, if, you, if you're... This may sound weird. This is off topic. If you're into Archie... If you're into, like, Sonic or Mega Man, look up Archie comics. I know that sounds weird, but it, I'm serious. The, the Archie comics of the Mega Man stuff and of the Sonic stuff is actually quite good. It's not great. It's not phenomenal, but it is good. It's worth looking into if you happen to be a fan of the medium. Um, it's weird, too. Especially since they do crossovers, so technically, you know, it's all the same thing. So, it, so if we are to count the Pokemon anime, that leaves us with, so far, a grand total of one show based on a video game that is acceptable. Now, I didn't like the Pokemon anime, but will it, it, for the sake of argument, I'll allow that. So we have one. I think my point is made. Now, that being said, I really want a good video game show. And that sounds weird, but what I mean by that, I've said for many times, if you've watched any of my Voyager stuff, and you've watched any of my Babylon 5 stuff, <clears throat> I, uh, I really think that television is a medium that is a fantastic medium for creative writing, for, for, for a particular type of storytelling. I've said before that there's several of my own stories, like The Primes. I would love for The Primes to be a television show if I had an ideal reality to do so. 
But I also, especially having gone through Voyager and Babylon 5 over the last couple of years, have learned even more about how much screwed up stuff goes into television than I already knew. So basically, the medium of television, my opinion, the medium of television is fantastic medium for storytelling. And the reality of making a television show is a mess, which almost always ruins the actual storytelling aspect thereof. Pax and I were actually talking about this last week, too. So, there's it, it's messed up. Now, granted, we are mo we're moving into an era where making a television show is a little bit easier and a little bit less screwed up, since there's less reliance on the networks than there ever has been before. Uh, and I, I do personally think that's a good thing. I think the networks being pushed out of the picture is something that should happen. Just like I think publishers over in video games should be pushed out of the picture, in my opinion. Um, and I think we should move on from that. But... I, I don't know any examples off the top of my head, Ventures, other than FF5, which was garbage. I'm just going to say it. The FF5 anime made me bleh. <laughs> but if there's any others, Ventures, I, you're going to have to tell me because I don't even know about them. But yeah, yeah, there we go. Uh, we'll see what they do with this. I uh, See, unfortunately, I'm, I'm mostly talking about the concepts here because I don't have a lot of news about what they're actually doing. Supposedly, this Castlevania thing will be coming out, like I said, this year. It'll be on Netflix, which means I won't see it here, but... Uh, my sister actually has access to Netflix, so if I go over there, I might be able to see it. <laughs> right. We'll see what they do. A quick question for you, actually, really quick. Do you think it would be better if Castlevania, specifically, was live-action or animated? Or CGI. Those are the three options, really. Now I gotta wait. <laughs> I've never even heard of those ventures. I mean, I've heard of the games, just not the animes. I suppose I should clarify Western animated or, or Japanese animated because there are there is a distinct stylistic difference between the two. Oh, I see what's happening. I shouldn't be having that kind of shading issues today. It must be brighter or less bright than usual today. It's really weird how much my, my green screen effect is dependent upon how bright or not bright it is outside. Even though I've got blackout curtains up, it still affects the lighting values. I suppose we'll see what they actually do. See, personally, I'm kind of torn on it, because there's a lot of possibility for... Uh, no, it does not, spell Clement. There's a lot of possibility for... Uh, how do I put this? Recently, there's been several superhero shows of varying qualities. And those superhero shows of varying qualities are kind of the thing I could see them doing with Castlevania. Now that the market is a little bit more open to that kind of thing, now that people are a little more willing to push that kind of a, tel a show onto television, and now that pe the, 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 very, the landscape of television in general has changed so much over the last 20 years. So the possibility of doing a live-action, semi-more serious drama piece of Castlevania is possible. They could also go with a super melodrama piece, if they wanted to, with Castlevania, with live action, which I would rather they not do. Uh, they could also do full-on animated, which I would be okay with, and would obviously enable them to do more with regards to the monsters, and the backdrop and the setting. I don't know, I'm not actually sure which I would prefer. I like the idea of a live action thing, but in my opinion, a live action thing would be so much more difficult to actually make good. Whereas an animated thing would be easier to make good. Just my opinion. Moving on, moving on. Speaking of television, who likes Deep Space Nine? Anybody out there like Deep Space Nine? Anybody? Anybody? Where's that? There we go. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about this, actually, already. Anybody who likes Deep Space Nine probably already knows about this. But on the off chance that nobody does... I thought I'd mention that they're making this thing. It's already been funded. It's on Indiegogo. Here, I'll give you a link right now. I've got it up right now. Bam. 
there's a link to it uh, for the Indiegogo project. Again, they've already met their goal. They're making a documentary on the making of Deep Space Nine. They've invited back a lot of the people. Iris Stephen Bear is a big pusher for this. They're adding in, you know, they've already got some stretch goals built out. Who knows what they're doing with that? <sighs> You can read the whole page. I'm not going to summarize it. They're bringing back a lot of the actors. They're bringing back a lot of the people who are involved in the making of it. They're, uh, they've got the same. They've got Adam Nimoy working on the directorial team, which is great. Uh, he uh, he did the For the Love of Spock thing. If you haven't already seen that, uh, he's also they're they're trying to bring in. Basically, the idea here is here's how Deep Space Nine was worked, and here's how Deep Space, Nine was, Deep Space Nine was made, and so this is a rumor, and I want to stress that with a big ol' asterisk, rumor, unproven, but I have heard um, that Iris Stephen Bear, who always basically viewed Deep Space Nine as his personal baby, that this is kind of a... I've heard, I've actually heard two rumors, but they're the same general concept. This is Ira Stephen Bear and the crew that he has backing him, his 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 uh, his affluence within Hollywood, basically, pushing for this in order to try and push Deep Space Nine and Star Trek in general a little bit more towards the top of the of the pile, either to push for CBS or push for the DS9 Blu-rays, or to try and in, you know make sure a new Star Trek show is made. Or, and this is the first rumor I heard, and the one that I put the most weight in personally, this is an attempt to try and preserve some of the making of Deep Space Nine, historically speaking, before it's too late, before we no longer have the opportunity to do so. If you don't know what I mean by that, uh, and I've already kind of done some of my prep work on this, so I kind of, I'm speaking with this with a little bit of authority, we don't know a lot of the behind the scenes of TNG. I mean, think about that for a moment. There's a lot of, especially season one. Season one is so weird when you look into the making of and the behind the scenes of season one of TNG because there's a lot of gaps in information where it's just we don't know why something happened and there's a lot of misinformation. And I know it's misinformation because it disagrees with other information, as in we've got conflicting people uh, saying conflicting things about the exact same thing. There's, so there's several aspects of TNG that, perhaps ironically, are just lost, and we don't actually know the real story of what actually went into it, or at least the closest thing to the real story, you know, the, the, the story that was written down as far as the making of. And so I'm actually hoping that this will help us to have a little bit of a better insight into Deep Space Nine. We do know a little bit more about the making of Deep Space Nine in general, especially since this was an era uh, a little more modern when they started doing that kind of behind the scenes a little more regularly. And Star Trek was riding high when Deep Space Nine came out. It's why they were able to have two shows going live at the same time, which was an unprecedented thing at the time. <sighs> Isn't that weird? The idea of, of one, net, one, one network and one group pushing out two of the same franchise at the same time was, was once unusual and weird. And now how many... We've got Arrow, we've got... Uh, it, it's Arrow, Flash, Supergirl... I can't remember the name of the other one. Is this it? Are these four the ones that are going concurrently with each other? Anyways. <laughs> like I said, the television landscape's changed a little bit. But I am hopeful that, I mean, it's been funded. It's happening. I'm hopeful we'll be able to get some good insight. I'm certainly, I mean, I've already backed it, so I'm getting my copy. I don't know actually know what else to say about it. Legends of Tomorrow, thank you. You can tell I don't watch the shows. Ah. <laughs> uh. I also bring this up because one of the things that's really strange for me is usually... Oh, apparently there's another one <laughs> about Vix. I didn't even know that. Um, by the way, hi, Myron. There was a movie. <laughs> Star Trek's awesome. Star Trek can be awesome. Star Trek can also be face-palming. Trust me. Uh, the other thing reason I want to bring this up... Excuse me. Is... For me, if I went, I used to go to Star Trek conventions pretty regularly. Me and my dad and my mom are, are big trackers. We've always been big trackers. Aren't they bringing back the Constantine guy, Taito? I heard something about that. Anyways, we're big trackers. We're, we're a tracker family. And, uh, you know, tracking, woo! And we, so we've kind of, 
we've been to a lot of uh, conventions, kind of stopped doing that after a while, obviously, right about uh, when my health started plummeting. So just before the start of this show, actually. But also, you know, I have a lot of friends who are Trek fans, and usually if I go to any of those people at the conventions or of the people I know, and I say, you know, what's your favorite Star Trek show? The answer about 90-ish percent of the time, possibly higher than 90% of the time, is Deep Space Nine. I've always found that such a strange thing. And I've never... I, I, can, o I can only speculate. Because financially, TNG was the success story. TNG was the one that hit popular culture. TNG was the one that everyone knows about. And was the one that everyone is aware of and everyone loves and sells like crazy. And DS9 is the one that's like the backdoor show that people are like, eh. And yet when I ask, actually ask someone who's a fan of Star Trek, they say, oh, Deep Space Nine's amazing. I mean, what was everyone's response in chat when I said, do you like Deep Space Nine? A lot of people were like, yeah, Deep Space Nine, woo. I, I, like I said, I only have speculations about that. It could, of course, be the... Uh, I can never think of the name of the movie. <sighs> I am really tired. The uh, Scott Pilgrim effect. Uh, quick quick thing here. Uh, the Scott Pilgrim effect, a lot of people are like, oh my god, Scott Pilgrim, and yeah, we're gonna go see it, and then nobody freaking saw it. Scott Pilgrim bombed financially when it came out. The movie, I mean, not the comic. And it was because all these people were like, yeah, we're big Scott Pilgrim fans, didn't go see it. <laughs> um, it may be that. It may be the fact that the people who like Deep Space Nine are, for whatever reason, unwilling to put their money where their mouth is. And there's lots of reason for that. I'm not trying to call anyone out. It's just that it is entirely possible that the people who like Deep Space Nine are not willing to maybe put down the money or put in the actual thing that is counted when it comes to making decisions about these things and be like, Psha, there you go. So... Moving along. I, this is all theory. This is all speculation. I don't know. I don't have an answer here. So. Regardless, Deep Space Nine uh, is an amazing show for all its flaws. And it certainly had its flaws. I admit I'm biased towards Deep Space Nine because it had a close... It, was, it wasn't actually full string continuity. It wasn't Babylon 5. But it was closer to string continuity, which is the storytelling I prefer. And I also feel like they did they did some really great character stuff. I often prefer an ensemble show, or an ensemble anything, actually, uh, rather than a, you know, A cast, B cast kind of a thing. As much as I love TNG, Picard, Data, and Riker were the main characters of TNG, and there's no arguing that. And then everyone else was secondary. We, we actually did this once upon a time on our stream. We were talking about how many show, uh, how many episodes... Beverly Crusher had dedicated towards her in all seven seasons. I don't remember the number right now, but it was like eight or something like that. It was not that many. Uh, you know, how many episodes did Jordy have dedicated towards himself? Again, not that many. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying this to call out TNG. I'm just saying I like the ensemble uh, approach a little bit better. Of course, DS9 also had that same problem, just to a lesser extent. I don't, I don't know what Wilson's on about the Cardassians. I don't actually get it, but anyways. Worf really moved up. It's actually funny. I intend to talk about that when we go through TNG, because Worf really started off as, a, as, a, as an extra with lines. He, he literally was an extra with lines. And then he moved from that to being an awesome character. Full fleshed out, fully versed character who was a, a distinctly... Uh... A distinctly uh, main character. Not one of the mains, but he was at least B-list. Uh, and then, of course, Worf actually got on Deep Space Nine. You know, but uh, just to, to make my point clear, you know, O'Brien in Deep Space Nine is a great character study. In fact, O'Brien might actually be... I have about three characters who are tied for my favorite character in Deep Space Nine, and O'Brien is one of them. He is a fantastic character study, and Cole Meany is amazing at him. Cole Meany just absolutely nails it. I was going to say, Data was the other one, Deacon, but I think I agree with you on that.
Riker had a character arc that ended, reached its natural conclusion. I don't mean to sound dismissive. It, it did conclude at the at best of both worlds. But anyways, I'm getting off topic. Let's let's just move forward. DS9 thing is funded. Woo! Uh, let's talk about FTL. The game, not the concept. Yeah, you gotta have at least one a, one a season, Die 2. Agreed, Man Darton. I, I, I'm, I've actually already referenced that scene, and I intend to talk about it extensively. <laughs> 500 characters, Gary. That's the limit. It's Twitch. It's not me. Um, for those of you not aware, which is probably none of you, F, the makers of FTL, which is Subset Games, are coming up with a game called Into the Breach. We know basically nothing about it right now. So this is just kind of a, hey, they're making another game. Of course, FTL is one of those indie hits that just... Was, was good. I mean, I'll give it credit where credit is due. I enjoyed playing FTL. And absolutely exploded in popularity. And uh, so the new thing appears to be Fire Emblem style thing. Turn-based, tile-based tactical combat. And there's also going to be time travel involved. And so uh, you guys know me. You know I am actually very much a big fan of turn-based, tile-based tactical combat. You know, XCOM is what I usually refer that to. I mean, I, we all, most people probably think of that as Fire Emblem or something else, but for me, XCOM is what comes to mind immediately. And, uh, and so yeah, there's this, there's time travel involved somehow, and there's some theories, and I actually agree with these theories, that there's going to be some roguelike elements, you know, new areas being regenerated based on the time travel and the actions thereof. The thing that I really want to talk about is the fact that there appears to be terrain, and the terrain appears to matter. And I make that point because that's come up several times in several of the turn-based, tile-based, blah, 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 games we've been playing lately, where terrain has nothing, where terrain is not. Um, it was actually probably one of my biggest complaints about uh, Banner Saga, was the fact that terrain didn't basically matter, and there was nothing I could do about it other than just positioning. So I am at least tangentially hopeful. We also know that the civilian cities quite literally are your health or your power. It's, it's either your HP, your MP, or both. It's, it's kind of unclear, but either way, your capacity to function is built off of the civilian cities you are defending. So that is interesting and pretty much encourages the player to defend them. It, it gives them the, the clear objective of defending the cities, not just defeating the enemies. The thing is, that sounds like that could be immensely irritating because it sounds like it makes every single map an escort quest. Or a form of an escort quest, I should say. That could be too, Gary. Either way, the money the money is the unavoidable thing, as I mentioned earlier. TNG sells better, period. <sighs> um, hi, Charlie, by the way. So I'm not actually sure... I'm not sure what to make of this. I'm not sure what to... to do to, about this. You know, it's... It's interesting. I will be getting it. Uh, it I'm, I'm doing a premiere run of it. I'm almost guaranteed on that. I really want to see what they do. As someone earlier pointed out, I think it was Deacon, I forget, because the chat's scrolling by pretty quick right now. But someone was like, good on them. You know, they made something good. Now they, they got their... Hang on, I'm just going to scroll up. Where was it? There it is. They struck gold with FTL. Let's see if they can make lightning strike twice. I'm absolutely with that. Um, it's funny because I have a similar note written on this about Lord of the Rings because there is no denying that Peter Jackson struck gold with Lord of the Rings. And as much as that may be the golden child, and as much as it's one of those things where, you know, once you make something good, you're now shackled to it forever because everyone expects you to make something good. From another perspective, sometimes people just think, you know, I've made something good, fantastic, now I can go out and try to make something else. I can try to, try to do something or try to do my own thing. Uh, Obsidian is actually a good example of this concept. Obsidian finally struck it out with uh, Pillars of Eternity and decided to branch off and start doing their own thing, which I'm hugely in favor of. So I am hopeful that these guys, whether this game is a good game or not, whether it is, excuse me, whether it is uh, critically or financially successful, I am happy for Subset Games for the mere fact that they are able to make a second game. It's one of those realities that we don't really talk about a lot, but everyone knows to some extent or another. When you try something nine times out of ten, you fail. It's the old entrepreneur uh, 
formula. You know, you try something and you fail nine times out of ten. You try to make a new show, you try to make a new movie, you try to make a new book, you try to make a new piece of art, you try to make some music, and you try to make a video game. And it's at this point, it's probably way more than 90% of those people fail. And it is nice to see at least someone be able to succeed and be able to keep doing and keep making more rather than, uh, and then just that's the end of it. I say this even admitting that I actually had several significant problems with FTL. <laughs> if I'm being 100% honest, I probably would never have replayed FTL if not for the fact that I was doing it on stream with viewers, because uh, that made it a lot more fun for me. Naming the people after viewers got me a lot more invested in it and uh, made me a lot more interested in the proceedings as opposed to the build-up. If I play FTL by myself, which I actually did briefly recently for reasons I'm not going to go into, I got bored before I even reached the end. So I was just like, eh. So I'm happy for him. Yay. Hello, Power Frog. I don't recognize your name. Welcome to my stream. Uh, we're talking about all sorts of geeky stuff today. This is just an aside I just want to toss out here really quick. Uh, this is sad, in my blunt opinion, but for those of you not aware, Infinite Warfare, and I'm going to use this quote directly, did not live up to Activision's expectations. I don't know how much it actually sold. I don't have numbers or figures in front of me. But uh, that could just be them, you know, oh, we, we don't care, or, or, oh, it didn't sell enough. It could be that crap again, you know, the Tomb Raider problem over again. Or it could be that Infinite Warfare already sold badly, but the, fa the sad reality is regardless, it has the same impact, and that's why I'm bringing it up really briefly, because it's such a damn shame that the first Call of Duty game I actually really genuinely liked since Modern Warfare 2 has come out, and according to the people who make the decisions is now going to be pushed away from, and they're not going to do that anymore. So, because it, it's the it's learning the wrong lesson all over again. I would almost guarantee you that the very next uh, Call of Duty is going to be much less. <laughs> Just, I'm predicting it right now. I mean, I was really hesitant about Infinite Warfare, and I ended up loving it. Which, which was just blowing me away. I, and it's, which is funny because, of course, uh, Infinite Warfare did have some really big plot holes. You, you pick up the idiot ball when it comes to the saboteur, the fact, the way the captain died, uh, and I think there was a third. There were three rather major plot flaw, flaws in it. Ah, it's, it's great, Zawan, you're right. It's so great that a good game is, is, is going to fail because of corporate people. And another game, which is also good, is also going to fail because it already has. <laughs> Clearly, Tai Tu. Uh, Eru asks, what's the Tomb Raider problem? Uh, so, the first Tomb Raider reboot, I don't remember which one it's called, don't ask me, came out and it was a big success, relatively speaking. And then Square Enix, the publisher, came out and said, this is an underselling game, it underperformed. The, that is the Tomb Raider problem. It's when someone basically puts out the mentality of, I want to make all the money, rather than I want to make a profit or I want to be successful. They want to be the next smash hit. They want to break all the records. They want to make tons and tons of money as opposed to simply making money or making a profit or whatever. And, uh, yeah. So that would be the Tomb Raider problem. Anyways, that isn't actually something I wanted to talk about. Uh, what I did want to talk about next is Steam Greenlight. Uh, where's my time stand? There it is. Steam Greenlight! So, for those of you not aware, Steam Greenlight is finally going... Boop. I talked about that last week, Roots. <laughs> Go watch last week's Lore Week. I talked about it like twice last week. <sighs> Do I think Blizzard has this problem? No. To my, I have never seen uh, Blizzard have that problem. No, I've seen a lot of developers, but not Blizzard. So Steam Greenlight has finally come out uh, with dying. As in, it's dying. It's going away. Um, let me just go ahead and say, I, I hate to play devil's advocate on this one because I hate doing that in general, but it's worth noting that Steam Greenlight was actually a good idea that I was actually hugely in favor of. It's just it impl its implementation was bleh, and they never actually monitored it. They never, ah! Your dedication will be rewarded. 
Uh, they never... Uh, lines, words. Um, I don't have a script, I swear. I don't. I have nothing in front of me. But yeah, Steam Greenlight is it was a good idea that has terrible has had terrible terrible implementation. Lord Mo Lord of Mordor is glaring silently at me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you Lord of Mordor. But yeah, they didn't the, the biggest problem let, let me go ahead and discuss this for a moment. There was no quality control because quality control means time. Now, time means money when it comes to employees. A lot of people don't really understand this. A lot of people don't really look at this this way. But for every hour you have an employee doing something, that employee is is based, that that is costing you as a company money. So a lot of managers and executives don't seem to understand that, you know, we could do this for free by making our employees doing it, but it's actually not free because you're playing, paying those employees and that the the amount of return you're getting from that employee's salary should be something taken into consideration, right? That's a whole other topic I don't want to get too much into. But my point is, when it comes to Steam Greenlight, uh, it exploded a little bit more than I think everyone uh, expected to, and moderating it would require a lot of man hours, which would require a lot of money, a lot of people whose job is literally just to go through and to do a pass of it. Now, in, in an ideal world, that would be fantastic to have that kind of quality control on Steam Greenlight. I would actually like it. You know, the, the ideal would be Steam Greenlight would keep going and they would just affix a massive overhaul in terms of quality control and moderation and some kind of oversight onto Steam Greenlight. The fact that Valve is not doing that just kind of makes me tilt my head a little bit. Now, we've actually talked about this a little bit already in the week. But what they're doing instead is they're implementing this new system where basically you have to pay in money in order to be considered for a license, and then you get a pass. We have no idea what kind of pass it is, it's just Valve has said there's going to be some kind of QA pass. And then it's put up onto the new thing, whatever whatever it is. And uh, the problem there is that that is... It's a new system, which therefore, because of the way it's being implemented, has the exact same problem that Steam Greenlight did. Because again, Steam Greenlight was a good idea, badly executed. So, th this new idea, who knows how it's going to wind up? I mean, it, at, at this point, honestly, we are basically in the pure speculative range of how exactly this is going to wind out and how exactly it's going to end up, because who knows? Uh, and of course, the, the really sticky question, which to my knowledge has not been checked yet, actually this morning saw if they changed their mind and they still haven't that I saw. The the question is how much money is going to be required to be to be submitted to the submission fee in order to put a game onto Steam now. Because the thing is if you put it too low, you're gonna have the exact same problems you already had, and if you put it too high, you're gonna create an artificial barrier of entry. So Oh hi Roximus, where the hell have you been, dude? Um so again, Roximus, when are you free for Dark Souls 2? On the weekends, it has to be a Saturday. So, this is, again, another massively, potentially flawed idea with, with many, many potential problems with it. And I have no idea what the hell you're going, what, 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 how this is going to work out. I really don't. Um, it will almost assuredly get rid of a lot of the more massive shovelware crap of just asset flipping and, let's be as blunt as we can, pure garbage that we've had on Steam. But, at the very least... It, it, it. Well, then we're not doing Dark Souls 2 because that's the only day I have for it, Deutsch. <laughs> uh. Yeah, we. we I, I, I unfortunately don't have much more self to say here because we have so few uh, bits of information. This is Defenders of Azeroth from the Cataclysm soundtrack. Uh, it's actually a variance on that, but that's still what it is. So yeah, I... I'm not sure what I think about this. Actually, I know exactly what I think about this. I'm going to go ahead and put put my cards on the table, because I, I tend to be honest with you guys, and that's my that's my job. It's also my approach in general. Um, so here's my honest opinion. You ready for this, guys? I think this is a corporate decision, not a good decision. What I mean by that is this feels like a push for 
a relatively, relatively cheap, relatively easy way to placate their audience, which is all the people who use Steam, while at the same time not putting any real work or effort into it. It's a band-aid. And the only reason they're doing it now is because it's gotten to the point where, it, you know, the, the Steam Greenlight problem is so overwhelming that it's actually caused legal problems. In fact, there's quite a few uh, in, uh, rumors circulating, again, asterisk rumors circulating, but I put a lot of stock in these, that the more recent legal problems of the last, say, six or so months is what's finally pushed them to actually do something about this. So, yeah, I I honestly think this, it, just, just going into opinion mode here, this is purely just my opinion from now on, I think this is a bad thing. I think this is a genuinely bad thing, even if it gets rid of the shovelware garbage. This is just them being like, pay us to get in here. Yeah, yeah, the curator feature is a great example of something that was a fantastic idea, and the kind of thing that I honestly was really excited about. I'm actually a curator on Steam as well. And then they just abandoned it just like everyone else did. So, yeah, exactly, Bergwin. So, anyways, I, we, yeah, I'm still, let me make this clear. I still use Steam. I am still in favor of Steam. I am still in favor of digital distribution. However, that does not mean I am a huge fan of Valve at this point in history. I mean, <laughs> they've done a lot of things recently, which are just kind of... They only, uh, this is actually a tangentially related topic, either la this week or the last week, I actually forget which, forgive me. They finally decided to start moving against gambling in Steam. I say that because they have been pushed legally to finally move against gambling in Steam. They were perfectly content to just sit back and let whatever happen. Uh, and, you know, it did actually profit them, and it wasn't until legal uh, issues were raised against them that they decided to do something. Now, that being said, I do think that the restrictions on certain forms of gambling are a little bit too insane legally, and I do think the law should stay out of certain things, but that's, of course... They we're still in opinion mode, by the way. <laughs> it's just making that clear. There was an interview that I've actually referenced before where they talked about how Valve is no longer a game developer. They no longer consider themselves developers. They're Steam full-time, all the time. And it reminds me of Emperor of Palpatine. Ah! What the they hell? They all do. It reminds me of Emperor Palpatine. I want to finish this thought. Um, because, thank you, Mikael Blitzkrieg. Uh, with no note, with no comment given, but thank you, nevertheless, for the $5. The reason I bring up Emperor Palpatine, hear me out. In the EU, Emperor Palpatine was a fiercely smart, intelligent, brilliant man, very driven, very ambitious, who expertly manipulated everyone around him and was basically just on top of the heap for years and years and years and maneuvered himself until he basically, he, until he became emperor, until he sat at the top of the heap, established the Galactic Empire, and then he went into something that I've been referring to as retirement. Uh, that is my term for it. I don't think the EU ever calls it that, but there is, an, there is absolutely no denying that after he won, Palpatine just stopped trying. He just was like, all right, I won. Wake me when you need me. And he just started sitting on his laurels because he won. He retired. And he just started letting other people run the Empire and letting other people do things. He stopped manipulating. He stopped being devious. He stopped being clever. He stopped exercising his brain. He was just like, yep, whatever, do whatever. And it is, in fact, that form of arrogance and lack of caring that led to Palpatine and being defeated at the Battle of uh, Endor. I think that's where Valve's at right now. They won. It's, hear me out. Steam was garbage when it first came out. You remember that? You remember when Steam first came out and just saying Steam was a joke? You remember that? Steam turned that around, and props to them. They really did turn that around, and they really did make it into something good, and they really did make it into something worthwhile. And they basically won digital distribution. And ever since that time, they have just kind of been like, yep, wake me when the Vong arrive. <laughs> That's where Steam's been at basically ever since. <laughs> so <laughs> who knows uh, I doubt Gog will actually have any real chance of waking them up but we'll see
I do actually use GOG Galaxy finally for literally only one game. <laughs> we'll see if I ever have any other reasons to, ins to put other games on it. The circle of life. Anyways, uh, I got one last thing to talk about. This is super boring writing stuff. If you don't want to listen to this, this has nothing to do with geek news. This just has to do with ri creative writing. So if you want to stop listening, you're, you're totally welcome to stop listening. Please make sure you vote, though. Here, I'll make it really obvious. Make sure you... No, let's actually put it, like, over here. I actually want him just below that. There we go. Like that. There we go. Perfect. Um, yeah, pretty much Lord of Mordor. I mean, I can't remember the name of the two people who finally basically retired from Google. What was that, a, two years ago, three years ago now? Writing. Creative writing. Who out there has ever built a setting? I'm just curious. Uh, I, I actually imagine there will be only... There will be basically no hands raised to this question. But that's okay. Uh, where is it? that and no where's my freaking hang on I have so many notes here I gotta actually find the specific notes I'm looking for is this it no there it is found it well, I haven't done anything professionally, technically, in my life, uh, Deacon, so, I mean, uh, other than networking, of course, <laughs> which I'm terrible at. Okay, so the reason I bring this up, uh, I get the questions a lot about writing, and so I wanted to kind of partake some of my own writing style with you, okay? And I just kind of wanted to talk about this in general. I actually uh, mentioned this in a Twitter recently. So those of you who are not in the know, I have a setting that I call the Imperium. I may eventually rename that to, like, the Lore Imperium or the Lore Imperium or something like that for branding purposes. But in my mind, it will always be the Imperium, capital T, capital I. And the Imperium is a wonderful place that has everything I've ever written connected into it. Now, most of my viewers know it more for the fanfic -y side of things. That's because most of my viewers are more interested in things related to things they know rather than my own original creative works. That's understandable. But lately, I've felt the more and more and more and more the creative push to try and push some of my own stuff because percentage-wise, about, say, 80% of the Imperium is my own original works and the other 20% is the fanfic stuff. And, uh... I, I kind of want to push the original works, damn it. I'd like to write my own stuff. I, I feel myself in the same position that Obsidian was in. You know, we want to work on our own IPs. Hell, Bioware had the exact same reaction, actually. When, when KOTOR was a massive success, they didn't want to do KOTOR 2. They wanted to do their own stuff, right? It's a simple concept. So I finally decided the first thing I'm going to push uh, is actually Periphery, which is part of the th something that's going to be coming out for the show as well. And Periphery is going to be a pseudo-freelancer interactive storytelling feature, which every X period of time will, uh, because there's no Imperium of Man, Boz Dogen, uh, because, uh, after, uh, every so often, probably every Thursday, there's going to be a release of a chapter or a few paragraphs or whatever, and then there's going to be a vote, and then people will be able to vote, and it's going to be a choose-your-own-adventure kind of a thing, right? The reason I bring this up, though, is the first thing I did I'm going to actually pull up my real notes here that I'm actually using for this. Which I actually have active right here. First thing I did was I was like, all right, I want to tell you guys about how I write characters. Because that's I feel that's the first best place to start. So first thing I did was I decided the framework of what I wanted to do. The absolute framework, some people of you who actually frequent my forums already know this. The framework was... New area opened up, people going to explore it, right? Which was designed as kind of a blank sheet piece of paper situation, but also established several things. In other words, this is going to be a uh, space-based, science fiction more, uh, more science fiction tilt kind of a situation, and that enabled me to have some places to begin with. I then narrowed it down pretty quickly after that to make it more of a freelancer-style thing, where it is actually a... Settlement, uh, settlement system, which is something I'll talk about in a minute, with a lot of people who are very technologically advanced who do not have access to FTL and therefore are 
for all intents and purposes, limited to their solar system. And that leads to, and I admit I, I probably was a little bit inspired by Ratchet and Clank as well, leads to a little bit of a situation where techno high technology is the norm, and that's the intent. I want it to be normal to be able to fly around in spaceships. I want that to be the equivalent of having a car in real life. But I also want to limit the scope of it significantly. And ironically, limiting FTL is a very, very easy way of doing that. Next thing I did was I started thinking about the ship that we'll be focusing on. And I stared at that ship, and I had to... The, so the very next decision I want to make... I'm just following my decision-making in order. I want to give you a little an idea here. Maybe help other people uh, creatively. First thing I decided was, how big is the crew? It would be relatively easy to make the crew a crew of one. One main character, one protagonist. No, it's... Uh, it's a fairly easy thing to do. Uh, Writing-wise, if you just want to have one person who you're always behind the, the eyes of. In fact, anybody who's read Harry Potter knows about this style of writing. With very, very, very few exceptions, and most of it was actually explainable in character, all of Harry Potter follows Harry Potter's eye, eye viewpoint. The camera is, like, 99% of the time, the camera is on Harry Potter himself, right? So that's one aspect of writing a, a story. You have it all be focused on a singular character, and that character is fleshed out through their interactions. The other characters, therefore, exist to flesh out the main character rather than uh, existing for their own sake or existing on their own uh, purposes. Pretty much the exact opposite of that is an ensemble piece. The idea of making a full, uh, a full crew of ships, a full crew of ships, a full crew on the ship, so that we have number of characters who all have basically equal share of the storytelling, and then there's a lot of gradient in between these two uh, these two perspectives. I decided I've always preferred ensemble pieces, and if I'm being honest, I feel like I do a better job of writing characters bouncing off of other characters rather than writing a single character who has other characters who explain that character. So I decided to go ahead and push this forward as an ensemble piece. It is harder to write a good ensemble piece. It's harder to put yourself into the headspace of multiple characters like that, but it is something that I wanted to do, and you know, so we'll see if I succeed at this or not. So we came up with the crew. That's the first thing I did. So I'm like, all right, now that we're at this point, we establish what roles I want. Now this is the first big thing I want to talk about, because uh, near as I can tell, I don't know anyone else personally, I'm sure there are people, but I don't know anyone else personally who actually does this style of writing. I don't... When I make a character, the first thing I do is make their back, their basics of their backstory and their ambitions. First thing I do. And then I, uh, from that point, I move forward, forward into making their role within the overall dynamic of the group. And then from there, I start fleshing out their backstory and fleshing out... Uh, the lead up to and their characterization, trying to build up why they are where they are now. All of now, the reason I say this so particularly is, but you'll notice there's three things I haven't mentioned: their age, their gender, and their species, uh, and I suppose their names as well. Names are the last thing I decide when it comes to a character. So I built all of this backstory for all these characters, and then after having done so, I then decide to affix a gender and age and a, uh, a uh, species onto them after the fact, after I've already decided on making the character. And I, th I say this this way because, in my opinion, too many people fall into the trap of making, to use an example, a female captain, or, uh, you know, an, an elven dude. You know, too many people fall into that trap of trying to affix something first, right off the beginning there, and that's their primary trait, and then as a consequence kind of has, you know, the rest of their characterization tends to flow from that cliche or that uh, starting point and has issues, you know, and then we lead to characters who are excessively built on uh, stereotypes, right? And is therefore not necessary and kind of uh, moves it away. Uh, not necessarily Lord of Mordor. Not if, you'd, uh, if you're building a backstory based on skeleton. So, for example, let's, let's go ahead and go with... Uh, the main character here, the main I shouldn't even call her that, the, the captain of the ship, Lessa Stiles, who is a woman, uh, who is human, 
and who was female. I already said you know, female, sorry. Uh, I forget how old she is. I'd have to pull up. I actually have a timeline that I use to keep track of people's ages and dates and figure out exactly where everything happens. It's this, it's a whole timeline software. Anyways, um, so when I built the skeleton of her backstory, I'm like, okay, she's a settler. That means she is not from this system. She is one of the people who came to this system because that's kind of how a settlement system works. You go there and then you basically stay there. Uh, that concept isn't actually that alien, uh, if you think about it. It's, uh, how people in real life do that, for God's sakes. The idea is, you know, I, I want to move to get away from it all. Very simple. So, she has, uh, I'm not sure I agree with you on that, actually, Lord of Mordor. But anyway, so, uh... Once all of that backstory, excuse me, I haven't even told you the backstory yet. So she's a she's a settler. The Empire, oh, excuse me, the Concordat has access to FDL, Rascor. Remember, this setting exists within the Imperium, in which FTL is a very common thing. So she is a settler. It's one of the, the first skeletal things I decided on. She is a person who is ex-military therefore is an Imperial, or was an Imperial, I should say, and has decided to abandon that. And there, and she is someone who is, shall we say, uh, very emotionally open. Three skeleton points, right? Boom, boom, boom. From these, I can, you know, all of these, this this is how I usually do my writing. I, pro, I pro, pro, po posit answers, which then demand questions. So, for example, why is she settling here? First question, you know, what, what caused her to leave the arguably infinitely better situation of the Concordat in order to come and exist on this settlement world? So I have to come up with a reason for that. Uh, this, uh, so the second point, you know, why is it that she was part of the military? Why did she, that means why did she join the military? How did she do with the military? How did that end? You know, and, there's, and then, of course, the third thing is the extroversion thing, and why is she emotionally like that? You, you follow how I kind of go this? And so I branch out from these. I don't actually have enough fingers to do this, but, you know, these posited several questions, which then had to answer, and then I, those posited some more questions, which I had to answer. And give me, give me a while, and I actually had a full fleshed-out backstory for her. Except I didn't, did I? Once I had most of the backstory set up, I was like, Female fits this very well. Uh, I think she should be female, and I think she should be human. Um, it, I could have picked about four or five different races for her, which would have been basically the same with the confines of the setting and how it works, but I decided human for the captain. I, I wanted to have at least one human on the crew. She's actually the only human on the crew. I wanted to have at least one human on the crew so that viewers would have a little bit more of a capability of, of interacting with and dealing with this character and as a way to showcase the differences between the other characters. The next thing I wanted to talk about, of course, is the fact that she is not a native. The other characters who are here uh, on the periphery, which is the name of the ship, actually it's called the Long Haul, but I don't want to get into that. Anyways, the other, the other crew members are all natives. They were all born within the settlement system. She is a settler who has come to the settlement system. So again, we've got, uh, we've got a difference in species and we've got a difference in culture. So I now have a way to in, introduce, showcase, and highlight the differences between these things across just the, the main cast member. Hey, Riven. Yes, elves are here and dwarves are here, yes, uh, at this point in history. But that brings me to my next point. I'm gonna just... Okay. <laughs> so once I started, uh, I got to the point where I realized I needed to decide her age. You know, that's the third point I mentioned, right? And I'm like, hang on. I need, I need to come up with her age. In order to come up with her age, I had to do something I haven't actually done in a while. Uh, and I changed it around and polished it a little bit. I had to uh, invent the Imperial Calendar. And then I had to decide exactly what dates happened when to decide when this happens. I knew generally when Periphery happens in the overall series of the Empire. I knew exactly when it happens. It's way over here towards the beginning, within the period I usually call the Arisal. But I had to decide when exactly it's not enough to know that it occurs in the early days of... You know, I needed to know the exact date. Which I can actually tell you right now, because I have... I sat down and wrote down every freaking event. So this... The very next step I had... I want to remind you, I'm still making this one character. The very next step I had was 
writing down the exact dates of all the major events in history up to this point in time, starting with the year zero. Uh, the year zero being the relative equivalent of the year 2022 in real life terms. So we had the year zero, and I've got all of these events happening. There's the first contact with the Azimdi. There's the formation of the Azimdi Human Concordat. That's when Magitek was invented. That's when core energy was discovered. That's when the first successful side warp attempt happened, etc., etc. You get the idea. But I had to go through and decide on all of these things, decide when exactly that happened, figure out what an adequate period of time is between them, so forth and so on, until I could finally get to a point where I was like, okay, now that I have established all of this... Now that I've come all of this stuff, now we have to decide when exactly, uh, probably not Inquisitor, when exactly this happens. And so I needed a certain amount of time to have passed for generations to have been born within a settlement system, and I had to allot for time for the settlement system to be built. Settlement systems are fully terraformed, by the way. Uh, they are crafted to be settlement systems. The Azimdi, A-Z-I-M-D-I. <laughs> Nothing to do with Enterprise. I guarantee you, other than elves and dwarves, none of these species have you ever heard of. That's also because I renamed them. Yes, 10,000 years in the mountains. That's also one thing I hate. In fact, if anything, I regret that this has to occur so far after the, uh, the year zero. The uh, So the actual storyline will begin in the year 160, to give you an idea of that. I'm glad you liked the Wild Lore run. <laughs> um, so I had to, so I had to decide all the, the timelines for this stuff, and I finally figured out. Okay, Lessa Styles was born on Wednesday the tenth. Uh, uh, excuse me, a Wednesday, which is April the tenth, the year one hundred thirty-one. Okay, now that I've got her birthday, now I know when at the exact age she is when the story starts. Okay, we figured out the age, but the thing is. Um, I wanted to go back, and so here's here's a little bit more of the functional mechanics of me writing, okay? Um, I sit down and I just start writing all the stuff that comes to mind with regards to the lead-up to why a character is the way they are. So I start writing, I actually have a page up, I'm not going to link it to you, because it's not done yet. But I'm writing up Lessa Styles' backstory. Once I'm done, I go down the list and find everything I referenced in that list and make a note of it. Then I go and write that thing. Then, everything I referenced in that thing, I add to the list, and I go and write another thing. And then another thing, and another thing, and another thing, and so forth and so on. You want to hear my list so far? By the way, I'm still on Lessa Styles. You want to hear the full list of stuff I still have to write out uh, full descriptions for? I have to define mundane. I have to talk about Rithvil Sog, who is a kobold. I have to talk about Orasa, which is a troll woman. I have to talk about the Naval Academy at Charon. I have to talk about Ferrothan Strider, the Vorsat, Reserse, the FES Longhaul. I have to define humans. I have to define the Azimdi. I have to define the dwarves, the trolls, the orcs, the ogres, the gnomes, the goblins, the kobolds, the Antithans, the Luvari, the Andurians, the Murkans, the Lamias, the Dredge, the Nashari. I have to talk about the Terranoch Confederacy. I have to talk about the Concordat Confederacy Treaty of the year 90. I have to talk about Emperor. I have to talk about Starhome, Earth, Azim, the Avenue of Scientific Progress, the Avenue of Engineering Development, the Avenue of Social Progress, the Avenue of Military Protection, Magitek, Sidewarp, Core Energy, the Consumers, the Leveler, the War of Annihilation, Zagmus, the Echoes, the Bureau, Olkis, Rikhan, Centris, the region thereof, Sector 1, Sector 4, Sector 6, Sector 18, Sector 21, and Sector 23. All of this is stuff that I have I, I have on my to-do list right now. This is all a build-up to writing one character. I want to make that clear. I haven't even looked at the other characters yet. Now, I do have frameworks. I have the skeleton of the other characters. I can tell you about them right now, uh, because I've decided on species and framework of backward, uh, backstory. We have Leara Weaver, who's going to be the expeditionary on the crew, and she's an elf. I'm not going to tell you anything about her backstory right now. <laughs> uh, we have the doctor, who is called Volya. He's a Luvari. Uh, we have the geophysicist, who is also a pilot. That's Vulkra. Uh, I don't remember that person's gender. That is a female, a female Mercon. <laughs> uh, we have the, shall we say, illegal person. That's Vorkrip, a uh, member, uh, former member of the Hokoi Syndicate. That's an Antithan. And then we have Glithen Strider, another elf. So we have two elves on the crew. 
I have also this 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 uh, one character my sister came up with, whose name is Veana Thompson. Uh, this is a another freelancer, who is actually also a human on a different crew, different ship, different everything. I also have a list of species. It's quite large, because there are a lot of species throughout the Imperium, and that also led me to an interesting question because I had to decide which of these species were encountered when, which is another aspect of the timeline thing. I had to decide when they encountered which species, because the overall story of the Empire, of course, is they left out, and I've always known this, they always, the humans were the first. It's always been the story. The humans were the first people to go out and go... And then uh, the, the very next species they encountered were the Azimdi. And the Azimdi are like, ah! Uh, and the Zimdi and the humans were, were just gelled perfectly, and this, this era of peace and prosperity and golden era happens. And then the War of Annihilation happened right after that when they encountered the third species, which I've gone out of my way to never really codify. I called them the consumers because I needed some kind of a name for them. That's always been true. I mean, I've known that for <laughs> since I was a teenager. But uh, the next thing I want to do after that is, you know, I don't know when they encountered what. So, for example, I decided the elves were going to be one of the earliest ones. They encountered the elves on April the 9th, which is actually a Tuesday, on the year 58. And uh, that led to, immediately and directly into the elven civil war, which I've actually talked about before. And then I decided which other species they've encountered and which ones they haven't. I also, so another way of writing, another talking about writing thing here. One other thing uh, that I tend to do is I tend to write concepts, and, I, and I'll, if, you, if, if you'd see my written works, it's literally just like, B, or ENEMY, or WAR, and I do it in all caps, so it's very easy to, to catch and look at. And I needed the Anurian, uh, I, I, well, what is, what is now referred to as the Anurian Border Wars, I kind of am Lord of Mordor, and it will be available to read theoretically. I need to work out some copyright stuff, but I'm pretty sure I've got that nailed down. And in re regards to Andre, obviously this is uh, intended as if this was our galaxy and our universe going forward. So the Anurian Border Wars was something that, that I know about now, but at the time I just had border conflict, that, in all caps. And it had to happen because it was connected to several different things. Uh, with regards to Lessa's character and her mother's character. <laughs> Another interesting thing there, by the way, I, once I finished writing all of Lesser, Lessa's setup, the, the rough draft, obviously, I then looked and said, okay, now i got to write all of her father's setup, and I wrote his backstory, and then I wrote all of her mother's backstory. I, For the sake of sanity, I usually only go back one step. I usually only go to the parents, unless I think the grandparents are significantly relevant. But... Uh, because if I keep going back, it will turn into this branching chain of doom. But I always want to at least write one or two steps up from the character to explain where they came from and how they developed into what they are. So Eressa and Vilhe are both uh, characters that have their own entries and their own backstories which are written. And that leads into their daughter, Lessa, the captain I mentioned earlier. Another thing I wanted to talk about, writing-wise, another thing I do here. By the way, I love questions. I, I'm, I'm not ignoring you. I'm just trying to get everything out before I forget it all. Whew. Yeah, Lord of the Rings is made up as, as, they went, as he went, by the way. Sort of. That's actually kind of debatable. So one of the other things I do in my writing is I come up with questions. Uh, so, for example, why was the Bastion formed? Why does the Empire not always let people know about the Empire's existence? Why does the Empire exist as a branching organization rather than one with a single leader? Why does the Empire seed worlds? You know, why... And, and, and just, I, I'm not going to go into more of this because some of these gets into a little spoiler stuff. But basically, after I look at all of the written works I've already written at this point in time, or the stuff I've come up with, ideas I've come up with, and I say, okay, why? Why does that happen? And one of the things that I tend to do is I then I just have that list of questions because one of the things I like to do is whenever I go down to write a new story within the Empire, within the Imperium I say, I want to use this story to answer one of those questions I, I want to answer one of the unanswered things within the history of my setting within this new story I'm writing not just because, honestly I just do that because I like it um, 
so I mentioned that because uh, there is actually a question that is answered. It's a very small question, but it is a question of the same that is answered within this setting, and it's something I wanted to address because it's actually relevant to Primus, believe it or not, <laughs> in, a, in a very weird way. Uh, but anyways, uh, I guess that's it. That's all I wanted to say, but sorry for boring you about my stupid creative work that nobody cares about. Um... If anybody has any questions, it would be a fantastic time for it. Otherwise, I'm going to cut off the poll, take a brief moment, um, eat my lunch, and then stream whatever game won. I should pull up the poll right now. Let's see where we're at. No, 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 no. Poll. Uh, the difference in the poll right now is three. <laughs> Just as a heads up. <laughs> that is hella split. My god. If I tried getting a writing job? Um, I looked into it, Sean, and I found out how immensely horrifying it is to be a writer professionally, and I decided that I don't think I could do that life, so I I did not know. Uh, sure, 11 a.m. EST works for me, Roxanne. SC2 ladder. Uh, no. <laughs> I don't feel like losing for the next eight hours. But yeah, the, the odds of any of my stuff actually ever being published is practically non-existent, if I'm just being 100% honest. It's one of those, uh... It, it, never mind. What Takoid is talking about is another interesting writing thing I'm going to mention here. Uh, everything, Lord of Mordor. Low money, lots of stress, uh, difficulty in actually owning your own work. It's messed up. Uh, but even if you avoid some of the problems that used to exist, like publishers, uh, those people, you know, there's ways to bypass publishers nowadays and go directly through, like, for example, Amazon. Even if you do that, the odds of you being able to make enough living to even have a roof, a bed, and food off of writing is practically non-existent. Uh, there's a reason writers like, say, Anne McCaffrey or Stephen King wrote, like, Books, 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 in order to keep solvent. Anyways. And I think I just answered Lord of Order's question. <laughs> uh, what was the other writing thing I was just going to talk about? Oh, right. One thing I also try to do is I, have, I try to check myself every now and again. Like, for example, let's say I'm writing something, and let's say I want something to happen. It doesn't matter what. And I look at it and say, well, hang on, that's too predictable. You know, that's too cliched or whatever. I then try to check myself because one of the things that I, I, I espouse and one of the things that I dislike in writing, and this is rather common actually, is I dislike when someone does something to be different, to to try and make a twist or just to, to buck traditions. I don't like doing it for the sake of it, basically. So, in my opinion, if I'm writing a scene to be different for no reason other than to be different, it needs to be rewritten. And I need to have a real reason for having whatever happens, happens. I do not want to do something just because. I, 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 I find that to be a self-defeating uh, form of writing. And I have, I have had that lesson because I am a terrible writer just like everyone else is. At least at some points in our lives. And uh, I actually learned that GMing, believe it or not, in D&D. That's when I learned that lesson. When you try to... Uh, when you try too hard to subvert expectations, and it just it leads to drugs, so I don't even do that anymore. And that's what I was going to say, Sean. <sighs> yeah, Worf's promotion on the holodeck in Generations is a fantastic example of let's do something different for no other reason than to do something different, as opposed to the tense early act uh, rescue of the scientists off of the station from the Romulan attack. They did it just to be different. <laughs> and it kind of sucked. <laughs> I'm going to have to just decide when this vote ends. I just realized that. <laughs> because it's so close right now. It's three votes away at the moment. I 
I think so, yes, Riven. Especially since it's usually more financially feasible for the company to try and get, convince you to buy the DLC separate, and since expansions have become less and less of a thing. You know, true expansions have just been slowly dying out. They're still there, there's still expansions out there, but DLCs, which is little content, have been uh, definitely on the rise in the last decade. Okay, I am going to go ahead and chop off the local recording. Thank you for uh, joining me, YouTube viewers, and I will see you next time.